Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, special forum on, uh, by the Don Dunson Foundation on Does Australia Offer Any Real Asylum? My name is Lynn Arnold and I'm uh, the MC for tonight uh, and the moderator will be uh, His Grace uh, Archbishop Geoffrey Driver. We're particularly uh, honoured to have all of you here tonight but also to have the Honourable Judy Moylan, the Reverend Tim Costello, Julian Burnside as well. I acknowledge as we start out that we are meeting on Ghana land and acknowledge the, uh, the traditions of the Ghana people and respect the elders past and present and future of the Ghana people whose land this is. Also welcome to this uh, land uh, members of other Aboriginal uh, nations in this country who may also be at this meeting tonight. The Don Dunson Foundation has a role to follow on the uh, strong traditions of uh, the late Don Dunstan who did so much to change uh, attitudes and to be a, a wind change director in our community. And therefore the Don Dunstan Foundation set up after his death has uh, taken itself the challenge of how can we affect opinions for positive outcomes in our community. The reality is that most of government and opposition perhaps as well is really reactive to public opinion. And we are the ones, as members of the public, who have the opportunity to derive the way in which that opinion will go. And on the issue of refugees, we have seen some amazing, awful public opinion expressions over the years. The 2010 election and the 2013 election both had the issue of refugees at centre stage. And in each case, uh, major parties in the country were actually looking to what was happening in focus groups and responding to those focus groups. And that should be a challenge for all of us to work out if we struggle with what the focus groups are saying, then it's perhaps because we have not been enough a part of changing the direction of that wind. So the Don Dunson Foundation seeks to be a part of informing and encouraging people to debate the issues and then formulate responses that might not otherwise be seen in the, public, uh, in the general public opinion. It's not a case of uh, wanting a silent majority, it's actually wanting a vocal opinion from our community. And so tonight's uh, forum is precisely about helping us understand many of the key issues affecting uh, the issues of refugees in our country. It is clearly a centre stage question, whether we want it to be or not. And we have various ways of potentially responding to it. One is a way that seeks to turn our back and ensure that what happens to those who come to this country are the, uh, the damned of a coherent hell, where we have a coherent society that we nicely and comfortably form around ourselves, and those who flee persecution elsewhere come into this society effectively as the damned of that coherent hell. Now it's my task tonight to introduce uh, for our, our moderator, His Grace the Most Reverend uh, Dr. Geoffrey Driver, the Archbishop of Adelaide. A former journalist and uh, sub-editor, uh, but also a, a noted uh, theological, uh, theologian um, and uh, church leader in this country, not only in the province of South Australia, where he is the metropolitan of the province, and also the uh, Archbishop of the Diocese of Adelaide, but also a leading person in terms of the Anglican Church of Australia generally. He is chair of the General Synod of the, uh, the Ecumenical Affairs Commission of the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Australia, and is also chair of the Migrant Refugee Network of the Anglican Church. Uh, he uh, takes an active interest in matters uh, international as well, and is a delegate to the World Council of Churches Assembly in 2013, and has strong links with the, uh, uh, the church in Egypt, and has met uh, previously with Pope Shenouda and Pope Tawadros. Geoffrey Driver has a passion about issues of global inequality, and has been instrumental in developing links between Adelaide and Southern Sudan. He leads a journey of young South Australians, for example, every two years into that region to give them an experience of uh, developing contexts so that they can be encouraged to come and play their role back in this country in that same regard. And as I've mentioned, he convenes the Anglican Refugee Network. So uh, he's been an, an advocate of, of many important social issues in our country. So he is an entirely appropriate person, and I welcome uh, Geoffrey Driver to come and moderate our forum tonight. Thank you, Lynn. It is a privilege to be part of the Don Dunstan Foundation's conversation on the theme, Does Australia Offer Any 
real asylum. As Lynn said, I'm Geoffrey Driver. I'm the Anglican Archbishop of Adelaide and Chair of the Anglican Church's Migrant and Refugee Network. The plight of the world's displaced and Australia's response to those who come to our shores seeking asylum is something for which I have more than a little passion, so I can't claim to be an impartial moderator this evening. The recent federal election, I suggest, saw the debate about asylum seekers descend to the political and moral basement. Both major parties were seeking to outbid each other in measures where elements of basic humanity and some of the facts were set aside. One party centred its approach on a no-benefit scheme. Basically, this meant ensuring that if people arrived on Australian shores, they were sent to third world accommodation in places like Manus Island. The claim was that this would destroy the business plan of people smugglers. But the inhumane logic of this was it involved using innocent victims in order to stop the perpetrators. The other main party pointed to deaths at sea and claimed the only way to stop such tragedies was to turn back the boats. No one offered a suggestion as to why the journey back to places like Indonesia would be less risky fraught with danger, the possibility of tragedy, then the journey forward to places like Australia. The logic certainly eluded me. Throughout, we had language which was loaded and often inaccurate, with phrases like queue jumpers and illegals colouring our national discourse and statements including the suggestion that many of the boat people were really economic migrants, although this was clearly contradicted by the government's own statistics which uh, recognised that more than 90% of those who arrive as asylum seekers turned out to be genuine refugees. Well, the election is over. But the question of Australia's response to asylum seekers still stands before us. People are still seeking to come to our shores. Tragedies are still occurring. For these people, does Australia offer any real asylum? That's the theme we're addressing tonight. Our special presenters this evening are the Honourable Judy Moylan, who was a Liberal member of the House of Representatives from 1993 to August 2013. She was a member of the Opposition Shadow Ministry from 1994 to 1996 and was Minister for Family Services and Minister Assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women from 1996 to 1998. In June 2005, she joined a backbench revolt led by Liberal colleague Petro Giorgio, in, a, in an attempt to end the mandatory detention in Australia of asylum seekers. Tim Costello is one of Australia's most prominent voices on social justice issues. Since 2004, he's been Chief Executive of World Vision Australia, and before that, he was a minister at Collins Street Baptist Church in Melbourne. Julian Burnside is a barrister human rights and refugee advocate and an author. He's known for his staunch opposition to the mandatory detention of asylum seekers and has provided legal counsel in a wider range of high-profile cases. By way of explaining the format of our evening, tonight we'll hear first from each of our three guest presenters. This will be followed by a panel discussion and there'll be an opportunity for questions to our presenters before we bring the evening to a conclusion. 
So I now invite the Honourable Judy Moylan to present to us. Would you welcome her? Thank you very much, Your Grace. And um, may I begin by acknowledging that we meet tonight on the land of the Ghana people. And can I thank uh, Dr. Lynn Arnold, AO, the chair of the Dunstan Foundation, and Donna Harden, executive director, for inviting me to join you tonight for this discussion. And I'd like to also uh, acknowledge my fellow panellists, the Reverend Tim Costello and Julian Burnside. And uh, to you, thank you for coming. It's uh, a subject also that's dear to my heart and obviously of interest to many of you here in this auditorium. Few matters have been more fiercely debated in the Parliament or more unsparingly ventilated in the media than the ongoing treatment of asylum seekers arriving by boat. The history of migration law in Australia is punctuated with legislation and hyperbole that has become ever more extreme and some may argue disproportionate to the problem. The call for tough deterrent policies has produced an uneasy alliance of left and right politics spurred on by sections of the media. But what is it that motivates a democratic government to implement policies that imprisons indefinitely thousands of men, women and children who have not been convicted or charged with any crime? Has our nation hidden its heart within an ever-hardening carapace of resistance to emotional engagement? What role do we as citizens play in the continuation of policies which should have no place in a modern, decent, democratic society? The negative feelings about asylum seekers held by many in the community are unlikely to change so long as governments operate asylum seeker policy under a cloak of secrecy and continue to use language that dehumanises and demonises asylum seekers. Each of us has the power to contribute to the miracle of change. That can and does happen when communities come into direct contact with asylum seekers. The relationship was so, this relationship was so beautifully portrayed in the ABC's Compass production by director-writer Heather Kirkpatrick of Mary and Mohammed. How many of you have seen this? Uh, not too many. I would rec highly recommend it. In fact, um, uh, Julian was uh, one of the legal counsel on this production, I understand. And... Um, it was a story of Mary and Muhammad, and Mary belonged to, Mary was an older woman. She belonged to the Bridgewater Knitting Group in Pontville in Tasmania, where a new detention centre had been built. And um, Mary was one of those Australians who was deeply sceptical about asylum seekers and deeply troubled and didn't want to meet any of them and um, didn't like Muslims particularly. She was quite religious. Are quite devout. And when the group decided to take up a project um, knitting beanies for asylum seekers in the nearby detention centre, Mary was very reluctant to become involved. Nevertheless, Mary's curiosity got the better of her. And when the day approached to deliver the beanies um, by the knitting group to the detention centre, she struck up a con she went along out of curiosity and she struck up a conversation with Muhammad and a friendship blossomed, she began to realise, it began to dawn on her. She began to grasp the import of what we were doing to asylum seekers. And um, she made, I think, some very telling comments. Mary said, 
People have no have problems. People have problems with people caging up animals and birds. But you know, to cage up human beings is not very humane at all. Freedom is something that everyone should be entitled to and should have. Having learned firsthand about Muhammad's、uh, journey to find a safe haven, Mary indignantly proclaimed, "The only stories we get are the ones that are fed from the media." If you'd not watched the program, I can、uh, say highly recommend it, and、um, it's a very outstanding production. In a campaign of fear, both people have been cast as terrorists, carriers of diseases, queue jumpers, economic refugees, and now officially labelled illegals by the minister. Contempt for our international obligations seems to know no bounds as we ignore both the spirit and the letter of the law and move to ever tougher policies. The most troubling aspect of mandatory detention. Temporary protection visas and offshore processing is that they do so much harm to people, and although designed to stop the boats, they clearly have not worked. Mandatory detention was introduced by the Labor government in 1992 as an interim measure, measure to deter boat arrivals. In the following years, after that legislation was passed, 5,000 people arrived in boats. Two years after the introduction of temporary protection visas, which the minister said was designed, were designed to take permanent residents off the table for those who come to Australia illegally by boat, 12,000 people arrived by boat. Out of sight, out of mind, has now been elevated to a principle of policy that warehouses asylum seekers in offshore detention. Under the latest version of the Pacific Solution, there is little chance of resettlement for those found to be refugees if they're ever processed. More disturbing is that the detention regime is increasingly managed in secrecy, with few opportunities for public scrutiny. And we are now continuing to incarcerate children. Just one year on from the reinstated Pacific Solution. Cast by the expert Houston panel as a policy to deter the boats and stop people risking their lives, an estimated 20,000 people still arrived by boat. The Houston committee or expert panel made 22 recommendations to the government after taking 340 submissions. Of those 340 submissions, 292. Opposed offshore processing. Yet this policy was one of the key recommendations. That is to continue with offshore processing.、Um, it was one of the key recommendations by the panel. And on this occasion, the new version of asylum seeker dumping was accompanied by the no advantage principle. We have never been told how this is to be calculated. So conceivably, people may remain in offshore detention. Uh, for a lifetime, just two paragraphs were written by the panel to justify such an extreme measure. Just two paragraphs. The bill to give effect to this recommendation was passed with unseemly haste, along with other legislation and agreements with Nauru and Papua New Guinea. It completed a cunning suite of measures to effectively avoid Australia's obligations under the Refugee Convention. It is the final legal brick in the creation of Fortress Australia. Can Australia do better? Yes, we can. There were plenty of suggestions in the submission to the expert panel, and many of the panel's recommendations for policy development were quite sensible. Except none of the other recommendations have been implemented. So let's take a moment to examine a few of the changes that could take place. We can begin by respecting the universality of human rights and making the foundation of our policies the protection of human life and the preservation of human dignity. 
put an end to political posturing and forge a consensus on the treatment of asylum seekers in the Parliament, one that meets our human rights obligations. Prevent the loss of lives at sea by establishing a properly constituted, adequately financed processing centre in the region so asylum seekers can seek protection through a properly managed scheme. Recalibrate our current offshore humanitarian program to manage refugees within our immediate region. Advance our bilateral arrangements with Indonesia and other Bali process countries beyond the issue of criminal sanctions for people smuggling and border protection so as to develop a properly managed assessment and resettlement program. Step up diplomatic engagement with countries producing large numbers of asylum seekers including Afghanistan and Sri Lanka, to ensure that protection of minorities becomes a priority issue. Change detention centres to reception centres and only hold people for so long as it is necessary to carry out health and security checks and set a maximum time for that to occur. Establish a well-managed and adequately funded research facility with both academic and parliamentary involvement so that our policies can be based on evidence. Then we might better understand the push and pull factors, for example. As it stands, the entire catalogue of changes to migration law in regard to asylum seekers arriving by boat as, is at its core a denial of fundamental human rights, the right to justice, and the right to freedom. The United Nations Human Rights Commissioner, Mary Robinson, observed during the 2002 Mitchell oration, I think that was in Adelaide, in actual fact, but in Australia, uh, she observed that human rights have become our common benchmark for justice, but they have yet to become our common framework for action. The consequences of allowing asylum seeker policy to be constantly drawn into the vortex of political posturing flouts our commitment to international treaties. It vitiates our ties with our regional neighbours, lends legitimacy to racist elements within our communities, and above all, it causes unimaginable harm to those seeking our protection. A change of policy will only be possible if enough Australians reject the current approach and demand more from their political representatives. So, ladies and gentlemen, believe in the power of one, and it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy Moylan. There's some things I'd like to pursue with you as we talk in a, a little while. The role of the media in contributing to this discourse and perhaps shaping it negatively, but also that which you've ended up with, and that's the challenge of citizens to actually change the discourse. You've said this is in our hands. I'd like to come back to that in a little time. One of the other things you did... Um, um, bring our attention to is the international nature of, of this challenge. Tim Costello's role in that international organisation World Vision means that he brings to this debate a perspective that reaches well beyond the shores of Australia. I invite you to welcome Tim Costello as he comes to speak to us. Thank you, and uh, I think you'll all agree with me that uh, Judy choosing to step down and out of politics is a huge loss of conscience in one of the major political parties. Uh, so thank you for you being that voice for so many of us. Well, when we address this topic of a humanitarian approach, uh, I think most of us here agree we need a change of heart. We need a change of mindset. We need to look beyond labels and categories and particularly words, this ridiculous debate we've been having over illegal, 
technically illegal to arrive without a visa, but not illegal to arrive and claim asylum. We know that when we sign uh, the UN Convention, it means that in part we have relinquished our right to decide who comes to this nation and when. That's actually what it means to sign the Convention and to recognise that people without a visa, without the normal papers, will uh, have a right to come here. We need a change of mindset because no person should be held in inhumane conditions, intense under intense heat conditions, in isolation which uh, traumatises and sends many mad. Refugee detention should be a transitory response and we should be providing proper health care, including particularly mental health care. People should never be dumped there for long periods of time to produce some kind of deterrent effect. This, as well as the TPV system, we know destroys hope. This idea of a deterrent effect has deeply troubled me. Now, I could argue this from theological grounds, but let's just think of Immanuel Kant's second categorical imperative, which has been a guiding foundation for the way we think about human rights and a civilised world. He said, humans are never a means to an end. Humans are always an end in themselves. When John Howard with the Tampa decided to send a message that we weren't a soft touch. He was profoundly abusing Kant's second categorical imperative. Humans were being used as a means to send a message. The means of trying to get deterrence, and Judy's address this, only seemed to become more and more cruel. I keep wondering whether we'll get to the point of saying, well, if we cut off some hands, if we castrated, if we really sent a message and made ourselves impossibly horrible. In some senses, we know that the system we've uh, devolved is metaphorically, psychologically, a form of castration, of amputation. The damage, psychologically, particularly to children, is terrible, and I think future generations will judge us. Only in the most exceptional circumstances should children be in detention. It would have to be a very compelling security imperative and the burden of proof on them to establish that. But ultimately, we have a choice to make. The choice is either to live by what we say our standards are, to afford people a level of dignity, or to turn away from what we just describe as too difficult a human problem. Ultimately, this is a choice of conscience. I think conscience, an Australian conscience, a public conscience, is actually what this debate is about. And though many of us feel that voices for that conscience are drowned out, not given policy uh, frameworks, are uh, somehow unpopular, we must not stop. This is us asking ourselves, what does our conscience demand? I often uh, quoted uh, Martin Luther King, also a Baptist minister and one who knew the pits of despair with prejudice and opinion totally against him and no real light at the end of the tunnel. He would often say, the uh, arc of the moral universe bends slowly, but it bends toward justice. I actually discovered he was quoting a 19th century, Theod uh, uh, 19th century abolitionist Theodore Parker, who wrote, look at the facts of the world. You see a continued and progressive triumph of what is right. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. But from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Well, that conscience word in the full quote, I only ever knew Martin Luther King's abbreviation, I think is actually what this debate is about. It's about your conscience and my conscience and us saying we will not be silenced. We have made a choice 
that our conscience acting consequentially with us with it act demands of us. Of course, with conscience, we then keep in front of mind that in a democracy like Australia, politicians do take their cue from what they understand to be public opinion. But public opinion won't be shaped and prodded and shifted with our conscience. We certainly are in a position to leverage now Australia's sort of blinking days stumble onto the world stage. We've just taken presidency of the UN Security Council. We are hosting the G20 in 2014 when Obama and the world leaders are coming in Brisbane. I was there in St Petersburg. I've got to tell you, when the baton was to be passed to Australia, it was incredibly embarrassing. It was a case of no appearance, Australia. Yes, we had an election on. Two Australian journalists, British-based only there, with the world's press there with Obama and the... Uh, uh, President Putin and others, and Australia to step forward to actually set an agenda, and we had gone missing. But we actually have this presidency. We need to use this as a point of leverage around conscience. Well, the change of heart needs to be matched by keeping the issue in perspective. We all know about the moral panic in Australia about refugees and migrants. We know it's based on serious misunderstandings. It focuses on boats, not people. It sees people on the move only as a problem when they're heading to Australia. It fails to see the global nature of the problem. So it focuses on some thousands of people heading to Australia and loses the proper perspective. There are tens of millions of people who are refugees and displaced. There are people in camps all over the world. But the good news is and I visit these camps as part of my day job, is 99% of these people in camps only want to go home. They don't want to come to Australia. They don't want to even go to Europe. They want to go home. It's a very small slice who, for political or religious or other reasons, have no option to go home. We know that a global problem should demand global solutions, and duties reflected on those. I have to say treating the causes of conflict is one of the better ways than the symptoms. Yet we've just seen the coalition government before the election announce the bipartisan increase in aid, which was to be $4.5 billion over three years, gone like that. Six years of campaigning up in smoke. A real cut in AusAid of 12%. We've seen the humanitarian intake levels not lifted. This is a failure of a global problem, of quite different responses elsewhere. I've seen firsthand the fear, helplessness, uncertainty when people's lives are suspended, particularly acute for children. Their world becomes surreal and strange. The panic and uncertainty in their parents' eyes that they read is debilitating for them. Everything in a camp is temporal and provisional. I uh, was in the Becca Valley in Lebanon where World Vision's feeding 120,000 people, Syrian refugees, in uh, the Becca Valley. And then in Jordan where we're with other agencies building a whole new camp, Satari is full, two million refugees. All of them just want to go back home to Syria. I uh, was quite struck that here is Jordan and Lebanon, populations of about 5 million each with 700,000 refugees each, taking them into their own families and their host communities and not shutting the borders. Just put that in perspective. 700,000 people in populations of 500 million, uh, 5 million. I was walking back to my hotel in Beirut after uh, being in the Becca Valley and... Uh, a voice called to me, would you like a coffee? There was a very humble little roadside home, a small business attached to it. And a man who said, my name's Malat. I said, you speak good English? He said, ah, oh, yes, I was an orphan. I was raised in a Christian orphanage. They taught me English. I said, I'd love to have a coffee. I walked in, sat down, and there seated around were eight Syrian refugees. Full burqas on with some of the women children. They didn't speak English. I said, uh, Malat, who are these people? He said, oh, they've been with me seven months. I said, you feed them? Yeah. You house them? Yes. Out of your own pocket? Yes. I said, I'm guessing my lad is a Christian. You would be backing Assad. Assad's a monster. 
but his Alawite community is a minority. The Christians are minorities. They're fearful. If the rebels, Sunni majority, win, it will be even worse for minorities. He said, absolutely. I'm praying that Assad wins. I said, these refugees you've had for seven months, what about them? Ah, oh, he said, they get up every morning and they pray to Allah that the rebels will win. I was really taken aback. I know a little bit about political tensions in a family. <laughs> I'd never seen political tensions like this under one roof. I said, why do you do it, Malat? He said, because they're humans. I realized 2,000 years ago, a few kilometers down the road from Beirut, the story of the Good Samaritan. The twist in that story was Jesus said he was left naked, stripped of his clothes. It meant when the priest and then the Levite came by, they couldn't tell he was Jewish. There was nothing to identify. They knew if he was, the law of the prophet said, of course they must help. Their duty was clear. But they couldn't tell. The Samaritan couldn't tell either if he was Samaritan. He responded to a human, binding up his wounds, paying the, the innkeeper's bill. Here was Malat telling me that story. And it got me thinking, why are Lebanese and Jordanians different to Australians? At one level, I don't think they are. I like to believe that if we had the faces and the stories and the experience of refugees really up close, we too would respond like Jordanians and Lebanese. There's a reason we never see this, the faces, why journalists aren't allowed into the detention camps, why the stories aren't told. Well, what can and what should be changed? We need to remember that Australia is wealthy and we can afford a far better approach, particularly in ensuring waiting times, processing times as short as possible. Credit Suisse just ranked the whole world, countries 1 to 200 on per capita wealth. Number one in the world for per capita wealth is Australia, $212,000 on average per capita. And second is Switzerland. On the Human Development Index, well-being, we come second after Norway. So we know we're wealthy. We know we are healthy. Are we wise? The loss of perspective. Fundamentally, we know there needs to be increase in settlement places around the world, including in Australia. We know that children should not be held in detention. That asylum seekers, if they're living in the community, should be allowed to work. Lack of work increases the burden on churches, charities, communities, and creates welfare dependency very early in asylum seekers' life in Australia. Enforced alienation and boredom has a corrosive effect. This is an example where we who are wealthy have lost perspective. There are cases where a person who wants to work or volunteer as an, as an interpreter to assist other people from their own country of origin and their willingness to assist is not given an outlet. We are unwise. In addition, keeping the level of assistance to refugees and asylum seekers below that of New START puts an intolerable burden on them, a failure of wisdom. Well, in making a difference, let me finish by saying we need the recovery of a, an Australian conscience. Do that in volunteering, in visiting the Welcome to Australia website. I think we three are all patrons. Starting a conversation like that wonderful story out of Tasmania. Talk to strangers in your community. Donate to refugee appeals. It's so hard to raise money for Syrian refugees. If it's a natural disaster, something in our brain says that could have been me and we give, a tsunami, an earthquake. If it's war, we say, oh, well, they should just stop fighting. And we say, and in the Middle East, they're all crazy anyway. They're crazy. Why would I give my money? We're talking about a million children who are innocent and who are victims. To actually do these things is recovery of conscience. Australia needs your conscience. Thank you.
Thank you, Tim Costello. I might say um, my wife Lindy and I had a young refugee person living with us for a little while this year and was very transforming. And uh, someone we'd met in the Middle East and were able to help that person come to Adelaide. Personal relationships are perhaps the most radical thing on planet Earth, I think. So um, finding a way to get involved personally. So, so important. I found myself asking as you spoke about what we are doing to those who are displaced, those who are asylum seekers, what is it we're actually doing to ourselves as well? What are we doing to the, to the Australian psyche? What are we making of ourselves by what we are doing? What are, what are we making to the ethos of Australia that our children shall inherit? What are we creating? It's something we might push a little further. What sort of humanity are we bequeathing to our children? On the weekend, I found myself in polite political disagreement with one of our state's uh, leading politicians. He was adamant that asylum seekers were illegals. Julian Burnside. The question of law and asylum seekers is one that you address with considerable experience and passion. We look forward to what you've got to say to us this evening. Thank you. Uh, can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land? It's interesting to reflect on the fact that um, Aboriginal communities across Australia have been unwaveringly supportive of the refugee cause. None of them have spoken against it. And in that context, it's useful to bear in mind that the largest single day's arrival of boats and boat people uninvited was on the 26th of January, 1788. <laughs> if anyone should complain, they're the only ones who could. I'm quite interested in the way the language is being used. A great deal of what I might have said otherwise has already been said, and I'll try not to cover the same ground, but I was shocked the other day, yesterday, when Morrison said that um, the uh, staff of the department are to refer to boat people as illegal arrivals. Now, um, we know that they do not break any law by coming here. We know that by coming here they give effect to the right enshrined in Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, an instrument, incidentally, which we were instrumental in helping produce uh, shortly after the Second World War, and it was an Australian who presided over the General Assembly when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was entered into force. Article 14 gives everyone the right to seek asylum in any country they choose. Uh, any country they can reach. Um, and yet, Scott Morrison insists that his staff should refer to them as illegal arrivals. Um, it is false. It conjures up in the mind of the average member of the public that they are criminals in some sense. That is his purpose, and with that purpose and that meaning, it is a lie. Um, it's also interesting to know that he is in he's instructing members of the public service to lie to people or to mislead them, and I suspect that that might be an unlawful directive. What, watch this space. <laughs> Morrison, of whom I am no fan, <laughs> has also been saying for months that uh, a boat people, if they're accommodated in the community, should be required to report regularly to the police and they shouldn't be accommodated anywhere near vulnerable people. All of this has a single purpose, which is to make the public think these are dangerous criminals. I cannot think of any greater slander than saying to a group of powerless, voiceless, terrified people who've done nothing worse than ask for protection than to slander them publicly by suggesting that they are dangerous criminals. And that's what Scott Morrison is doing. And that purpose, I think, makes the whole exercise even more shabby than it otherwise is. 
Morrison said yesterday that he only wants to call a spade a spade. Well, I'll do that. I'll call Morrison a liar because he is a liar. And we know... <laughs> we know that politicians steal from us. We really should draw the line at them lying to us. And especially when they lie to us for the purpose of making it seem respectable to reduce the humanity of one group in order to be able to mistreat them. We've seen that pattern before and we know where it can end up. Frankly, I, I find it extraordinary that Morrison can be so hypocritical as to adhere to his proclaimed Christian faith and yet carry on as if this is a group of people who are less than human. He really does not understand what he's doing. Or, perhaps worse, perhaps he does understand what he's doing. Um, I want to mention something about deterrence. We've heard a couple of references to that. The logic of deterrence is useful to bear in mind. The logic of deterrence, obviously, is that if you have a choice between two things, you will be deterred from the more objectionable, the more dangerous, the less pleasant, and you will prefer the other. The logic of deterrence, therefore, is that people who are fleeing the Taliban or the theocrats in Iran or the Rajapaksa government in Sri Lanka, that those people will be deterred from coming to Australia, but only if we look worse, only if we look worse than the Rajapaksa government or worse than the Taliban or worse than the mad mullahs of Iran. That is not the sort of Australia that we should want. I do not think any of us want to live in a country that is regarded internationally as worse or more objectionable or less attractive than those three regimes which are the source of most of our asylum seekers in recent years. And yet, that's what we're after. Now, if you want deterrence, here's an idea. Um, what about, I could promise, I could promise Scott Morrison uh, a way of deterring any asylum seekers from ever coming here again. All you have to do is take a couple of children out of detention, just a couple out of the 1,700 children in detention, take them out and publicly execute them. That would deter people. And if he'll do that, then no more asylum seekers will come. Will he do that? I don't think so. That would just look too unpleasant. Well, what about just taking half a dozen of them out and publicly torturing them? Just for a few days. Just a few days of public torture, show it on television across the country and across the world, and that will deter people from coming. Will he do that? No, probably not. He wouldn't want to be caught out doing something like that. So what he wants to do is to hide it all away. Hundreds upon hundreds of children, 1,700 children locked up in detention in Australia, thousands of people shunted off to other countries where they'll be out of sight and their misery will not affect our conscience. Is it any more decent than the public execution of a couple of children for the purpose of deterrence? That's the moral equation which Scott Morrison seems not to have addressed. And if that sounds a bit dramatic, it actually isn't. We know the profound psychiatric harm which we are inflicting on people right now. In the first wave of the Australian excitement about refugees between about 2001 and 2005, we saw in detention centres and then on Nauru, we saw people fall into hopelessness and despair after about 12 to 18 months. And when they fall into hopelessness or despair, they either lash out and attack their environment or they attack themselves. Self-harm uh, uh, cuts in at about 12 to 18 months. But this time round, having learned all of those lessons and, and apparently eager to improve on the past, uh, this time we are telling people, you've got no hope of getting into Australia. We can't tell you how long you're going to be locked up here. We'll have to see how the no advantage principle applies to your case and in already in Nauru, self-harm started after about six months. We have so refined our instruments of torture that people are now breaking much more quickly than before. I hope Scott Morrison's proud of that, because frankly, if he doesn't recognise that that's what he is doing to human beings, we should remind him. And the reason we need to remind him is this. I want you to try and imagine yourself into the shoes of the sort of people who are coming here, the sort of people who are being treated like this, the sort of people who are being maligned as illegals, uh, uh, um, the sort of people who Scott Morrison wants to traffic to other countries. I want you to imagine that you're a Hazara and you've fled the Taliban. 
You've seen neighbours killed. You've seen children used as walking minesweepers. You've seen uh, people executed in the streets of Quetta by uh, Taliban snipers. You've been, seen people dragged off buses selectively for being Hazaras and beheaded and with their heads left beside their torsos. All of these things are happening. They all know about it. They're all terrified. They're all leaving. And at the end of this year, when Allied troops pull out of Afghanistan, it will be a bloodbath. I want you to imagine, then, that you are one of these people. And you've made your way down through Malaysia to Indonesia, both Muslim countries. Neither of them have signed the convention. Neither of them offers you any protection. If you're in Indonesia, uh, you will not be allowed to work, you'll be jailed if you're found, you can't send your children to school, you will wait between 20 and 40 years before any country offers to resettle you. You've got a choice. You can wait 20 or 40 years for resettlement, or you can take your courage in both hands, get on a boat and head to a place of safety. Is there anyone in this room who wouldn't choose to get on a boat? Have you ever met anyone who wouldn't choose to get on a boat? Why do we think it decent or proper or sensible to mistreat that group of people who act exactly as we would if we were in their shoes? There's the question. There's a question about our national character. We would act courageously. We would do whatever was necessary to reach safety. It's a natural human response. But what we are doing, in fact, is demonising them and then brutalising them because they have done what we would do if we were in their shoes. And at the same time that this is going on, our national character is being degraded. Inevitably, inexorably, it is being degraded. We still fancy ourselves as a warm, generous, sunny, welcoming nation, a place where the fair go is part of our DNA. But what we're seeing as overseas, we are seeing as a country that is rich and selfish and cruel, and it's getting worse. This debate is not just about the proper treatment of asylum seekers. It is about the character of this nation, oh. and it's about each of you. Because if you stand by and watch our national character being despoiled, if you stand by and watch us destroy the lives of people who are just seeking safety then you become part of the problem. It is time for this country to recognise what is being done in our name, and it is not something any of us should approve. Unfortunately, the media are uh, making common cause with the, with the coalition. They report mostly what the coalition says. They don't put the alternative argument. And let's be even-handed about it. Labor had plenty of opportunities in opposition and in government to stand up and say it's all false, they're not illegal, they're not committing any crime by coming here, they're not queue jumpers. Bob Carr, note, they are not economic migrants. 90% of them are ultimately assessed as genuine refugees. These are people who deserve our decent treatment. And we seem not to notice that because Labor wouldn't tell us and the press report what the coalition are doing. Let me um, mention an alternative, and a number of you will be familiar with this alternative. Um, it seems to me that an open borders policy is probably not sensible, and I've never advocated it. But I would say that if people arrive here seeking protection, then they should be detained for one month only, maximum of one month for preliminary health and security checks as a natural precaution. After that, release them into the community on interim visas with a few significant conditions. First, they are entitled to work. Give them the dignity of oh. being able to work. Second, they are entitled to Centrelink and Medicare benefits. Third, whilst their, whilst their refugee status determination is pending, they need to report regularly, every couple of weeks, say to a Centrelink office or a post office, not a police office, a police station. And fourth, crucially, until their refugee status is determined, they should live in specified country towns or country cities. The reason for that one is this. Um, at the moment, we are spending about $4 billion a year mistreating people 
who will, most of them, ultimately end up as permanent residents or citizens of this country, but they'll be less effective as that because we will have damaged them by the way we treated them. Instead of spending $4 billion a year, if every single one of them remained on Centrelink benefits, it would cost us about $500 million a year. We would save $3.5 billion a year just by acting decently. And I would not want the politicians to use that spare three and a half billion for going to Michael Smith's wedding, <laughs> but I'd allocate a billion a year for the construction of public housing for homeless Australians, and maybe a billion a year to put into Indigenous communities where they desperately need more genuine support. We've still saved one and a half billion, and we might start restoring our national character. Let me finish with a point that Tim touched on, and I had actually f forgotten about this. We started a letter writing program many years ago, and in the uh, middle of 2002, I think, we received a letter from a guy in Port Hedland. He's an Iranian. He told a bit in halting English about his life in Iran, and he told a bit in halting English about conditions in Port Hedland and he expressed his gratitude for having received a letter from someone in the Australian community who was concerned uh, that they were being treated in an unfriendly way. And he finished with a sentence I'll never forget. He finished by saying, please don't forget us, we are human. And that's what we all need to remember. Mm -hmm. Following on there, Julian Burnside, you've talked about how a key part of the present policy is to objectify people, and that only works if you can minimise human contact. Because once, once you uh, establish contact, once relationships form, the capacity to objectify people is lost. So how can we, as ordinary Australians, breakthrough to form relationships and so change things? It's, it's really quite hard. Um, visiting detention centres I think is pretty good because then you get to actually meet uh, asylum seekers and recognise that yes they are indeed human. Um, Mary Meets Muhammad is a very good illustration of that it's a, and it's a, it's a true mm. Film. I mean, it's not, it's not a fiction. It's, it's, it's just sort of live documentation, and it's really interesting to see how Mary sort of shifts around uh, from really thinking that these are sort of, you know, the Muslim horde to thinking, oh, oh yeah, he's human. He's not a bad guy. Yeah. It's, a, it's fascinating. Um, writing letters to people in detention, I, I suspect, yeah. is actually quite useful. Um, you know, the letter-writing campaign, one of the things that surprised us about it was that people started sending us copies of replies they'd received and some of those letters later formed part of that collection called From Nothing to Zero. And most people who read letters written in detention centres are suddenly touched by the sense that they are not seeing these possible criminals that they've read about in the papers. They're actually communicating with a human being and it changes people. Now, that's probably as close as we can get. Uh, I think letting them live in the community would be a much, much better way of doing it. A much better way of doing it. And, you know, there are so many success stories of Young in New South Wales and, and Neil in Victoria. Um, these are places where accommodating refugees in the community has been really, really successful, and it can be done. And, by the way, country towns are pretty keen on the idea of the extra, you know, half a bill in um, government money... I think, though, I think what would be really, really good is to get this idea going and get lots and lots of country towns right across the, 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 the nation all writing to Canberra saying, we want some refugees. Would you please send us some refugees? Now, let, let the National Party do its, pull its weight. <laughs> In 2011, I was criticised by supporting the uh, possibility of Inverbracchi being used here in South Australia. And I received lots of fairly insulting mail for supporting that suggestion. And it's interesting because so transforming has been the contact 
but now the community <coughs> around Inverbrackie think it's wonderful and want it to stay because they've developed relationships. Perhaps that's an example of what you're talking about. Mm. I might say um, I, I enjoy having my hair cut by uh, a guy who's a Hasara, hasn't been out here that long, and just forming that relationship, as you do um, when someone's cutting your hair, um, probably takes me a bit longer than you, Tim. <laughs> um, but it does mean that, uh, that the personal contact is so powerful. And I suspect it might even be powerful for our interactions with our politicians. So easy to write a letter, much harder, uh, but perhaps more effective to actually see yeah. an I'm, interview. I'm very keen on the idea of people writing to their local federal member and the representative of the other major party. Okay. Mm. I don't think it matters too much. But I think the important thing is not to send them a pro forma letter, mm. to send them a simple letter, preferably with a hand-addressed envelope, um, and ask a few really simple questions like, do you regard these people as illegal? What offence do they commit? Mm. And when you get, and here's the trick, when you get a response, which will be a two-page uh, pro forma thing mm. done by a staffer, write back and say, you are my local representative. I asked you some questions. Can you answer them? Mm. Or can I come and see you? No, no, no. Just, I just say, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, let, let me just add to that, and Judy, I'm sure, will have a political reflection on this. I actually think there might be some hope in that strategy with the Nationals. Um, so, Nationals, what, 4% of the vote, 9 seats? Um, but I happen to know uh, a couple of Nats I've talked to who are hearing from their communities about keeping the abattoirs open. It's Afghan refugees in Shepparton that have kept the abattoirs open and the jobs. And Really interesting picking up the Indigenous uh, line there. Indigenous in Shepparton uh, tell me they love the Afghans. Uh, they're great people. They are really impressed that the Afghans, being Muslim, don't drink, and that's seen a number of the Indigenous decide they're not going to drink. They won't take it from whites, <laughs> uh, with all of our history. Interesting spin-offs, which um, local members and others start to see, and I think what Julian suggested is, is an interesting strategy. Hmm. Uh, Judy, um, we, you spoke to us about the role of the media. What do you understand might be done? How, how, can, how can that influence of the media be redressed in some ways? Uh, what can we do to... Thank you. Um... Look, can I just, uh, just for a moment support what Tim and mm. Julian have said about letter writing? Um, and I'll share with you, if I may. Um, when uh, I was working with Petro Giorgio and Bruce Baird and Russell Broadbent to bring about changes to the Migration Act in 2005, uh, the guys wouldn't do any media. They wouldn't go on television mm. and 7.30 report, I think, or late line were pushing one of us to, to go on. And I said, well, you know, John Howard always, the one thing he always did was he went out there and explained to people what he was doing and why he was doing it. And I think we can't bring this bill into Parliament and not go out there and explain to people what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I ended up being the reluctant volunteer to do 7.30 report, I think it was. Do you know, after that, and the theme of it was um, really, my comments come back to what I said tonight. We have signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So let our beginning point of any policy be the protection of human rights and human life and the preservation of human dignity. And you know, after that show, within the next few days, about a week, I st I've sent the letters off to the National Archives. I had 8,000 pieces of mail from people mm. all over Australia, of all age groups, mm. of all social groups, of all religions, from young children to retirees and everything in between. And probably one of the most poignant letters was a man in one of the rural communities of Victoria who said, my wife and I have taken in an Afghani man who lost a leg and an eye in the war. He's been separated from his wife and five children we got Red Cross to locate them and finally found them in Pakistan. We are supporting the children because in Pakistan they can't go to school, so we're paying for their education. But the thing that touched me most deeply about that letter 
was the fact that he said this man's pain is palpable day to day because he is on a temporary protection visa which means he cannot leave this country to go and visit his wife and children and he cannot bring his wife and children here to Australia. That was deeply moving. You know, my staff who opened the letters wept. I mean, we're pretty used to some difficult situations. But some of those letters were so touching, so heartfelt. They weren't Romeo copies. They were genuine, heartfelt letters. And they now reside in the National Archives. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry to move off this subject, no, no, race, um, but I think it is so important for yeah. you to understand that in a democracy, it only works when you, the people, begin to engage. And that's one of the ways that you can engage. Let your members of parliament know if you are not happy with the policies that they are supporting. And in defence of my National Party colleagues, um, you know, Kay Hull, the former member for Riverina, who's become a very good friend of mine, she and her husband, who passed away last Christmas, took in a whole family of African refugees, treated them like their own family. Hmm. She's an amazing woman. And many of, you know, many of the National Party people would come up to me in the corridor after I'd given my latest blast in the party room and say, you know, Judy, you are right about this. So I think, and, and the communities in the country, I had letters from Albany in Western Australia, my home state, and they said, we love our Afghan refugees. We don't want them sent home. They're on the footy team. They're part of our community. They're working in the abattoirs. We like them. And not so long ago, a detention centre was set up in Northam, a town in my former electorate, and there was a big meeting. A thousand people turned up. They bust in a whole lot of former One Nation people who held up placards and said, shoot them out of the water. But, you know, I got up on the stage and I said, let's close the detention centres. And, you know, I got a huge round of applause and I thought I might be run out of town. And when I went to the town recently, they held a thank you meeting for me on my retirement and they were telling me what fantastic people these young fellows in the refugee, in the, cent in the detention centre are. They were out on the oval playing footy when I came to town. Um, so, you know, the country people are fantastic. They changed. When we were trying to get those changes, they were very influential. The, what were they called? Rural people for refugees. Yes. They were amazing. Just amazing. So I think we've got a lot of support out there in the country. I gave the ninth oration in Armadale recently to the humanitarian group there. They, they just, I, I am just so deeply touched by what that community is doing for refugees. I have to tell you, I, I was just completely blown away by their generosity. Let me come back to that um, question. Those stories are so powerful because they're deeply personal. Yes, it is. Um, and in a country town, those stories spread. How can we bring those sorts of stories to influence the public discourse that is so often um, created by the mass media? I've, I've experienced it myself. Uh, as Lynn Arnold said, every couple of years we take young people from Adelaide on a what we call a youth pilgrimage, but always we have one or two refugees go with us and sometimes we'll go back and, and I'll hear the story all the way and I have to say they usually come back pretty inspired and pretty angry um, as well um, because they've got to know at a deep and personal level the realities. They're very powerful stories but how can those stories be uh, brought to bear on the sort of public uh, language that we're hearing largely through the, mis through the mass media? Well, perhaps if I could just lead off briefly on that. And that, look, when you hear people on radio um, using demonising, destructive language, and um, I heard the author uh, Richard um, uh, King recently. He wrote a book, uh, published a book recently called "On Offence: The Politics of Indignation." 
um, don't be offended. Just get in there and tell them how it is. You know, we have to be we have to begin to be able to argue the case, not just be indignant. And um, I mean, Richard King made this comment. He said, "We have to show people who would be manipulated." just precisely how they are being manipulated and how their feelings of resentment and anger is being whipped up and weaponized, not in any constructive way, but in a way that gives these um, feelings a legitimacy that they probably don't deserve. So we need to answer those people, not remain silent. And um, I'm always trying to say to the media, look, there are some great stories out there. You know, one of the first refugees I helped get out of asylum seekers out of Villawood was driven out of the gates of Villawood by a Jewish family, taken in by a Jewish family, a Muslim man. And the first Saturday, they took him to synagogue and the Jewish rabbi welcomed him to the community. I went to lunch with them and they had the... Muslim fair and the Jewish fair on the table. That family is still supporting this man, who, by the way, he was a professional man in Iraq. Mm. He was a gardener from the time he walked out of the detention centre. He worked as a gardener. And when I had coffee with him recently in Sydney, he's just completed his master's in business administration. Thank you. Tim Costello, uh, you've... Uh yeah. I was just going to say, I completely agree with what Judy says. We've all got to try and get around and tell people about the refugees we've met. The only thing that slows me down a little bit on that is I've been doing that for 12 years and it doesn't seem to have worked. <laughs> we, we've, we've slipped a long way backwards. I mean, 2001 seemed awful, but this is just beyond belief. Um, anyway, you know, you know, so it's a few steps forward and a few steps back. Um, I, I just wish everyone could read a book that was published a few years ago called The Rug, Meter, Rug Maker of Mazari Sharif by Najaf Mazari. If any of you see it in the shops, get hold of a copy. It's very good. It sort of tells his story, and he's alternately in Woomera, in Mazari Sharif, in Woomera, in Mazari Sharif, and so on. So you get the story that caused him to flee and so on. But it is the most extraordinary first sentence, and it's years since I read it, but my recollection is that the book opens with him in Woomera and he says, I never knew there could be so many tears without a body to bury. That's a reflection on what we do to people in detention. Yeah, look, I'd just add that um, I think sh stories are the way we actually share the pain and share humanity. So telling stories is fundamental, whether it's after 12 years not working brilliantly, Julian or not, I don't think we have any choice. We've got to keep... <laughs> Keep actually telling the stories. As I said, uh, you know, there's a reason why journalists are kept out of attention centres, and that, that's because stories, at the end of the day, do have a potency, and we have to keep telling them. And I think um, one of the ways is unpacking. I think Julian addressed this in part tonight. The the very clear shift that seemed to occur when Australians, I think, had a whispering in their souls and a bit of uneasiness in their conscience about how we're treating people to suddenly, but this is all about stopping people drowning. So suddenly it became that high moral ground and there was a whole lot of people who said, well, I guess if that's what it's about, you know, I'm in and that if it's got to be harsh to do that, then... So I actually think following where the story is going in the political landscape and finding ways to actually pierce the, the untruths of it is really important too. Can, can I add something to that? That, that is right. The, after they got sick of bagging people smugglers, they started saying, oh, we're worried about people drowning at sea. So we're really being, you know, we've got to be cruel to be kind sort of thing. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things you need to remember about that and, and stop people if they are following that line. The first is uh, that what we do is we wait until people arrive safely and then we cart them off to Nauru or Manus Island. That doesn't seem like saving them if the peril is already passed. Um, second, uh, the fact that people drown um, is awful, of course. Every single drowning is terrible. But people who do not flee for safety get killed in their home country. And the person who stays home and is killed by the Taliban is just as dead as the person who drowns. 
and it's the ultimate expression of human autonomy that people should choose between that danger and that danger, and if they die in their attempt to escape, that was at least a choice that they're entitled to make. The third thing is, I do not believe the coalition for one instant when they say that they're worried about people drowning because they've just reintroduced temporary protection visas. The man that Judy spoke about a moment ago is a good uh, case study for what happens with temporary protection visas. They're not allowed to leave the country and return so they can't visit their family and they're not allowed family reunion. The only way the families can be reunited is for the wife and the children to use a people smuggler. TPVs are a guaranteed magnet for people to use people smugglers and they will increase the drownings. And that's why you know that the Liberals are not sincere when they say they're troubled about people drowning. They're not. Thank you. I'm going to open this up to the floor and uh, you'll find on both sides there's a microphone. Uh, we'll bring those into the aisles and uh, if you want to uh, ask a question... And I encourage the questions to be questions and not long statements. Would you please move to one of the microphones? Thank you. We'll take the question from that side. And you may wish to address one or one of our panellists in particular or all of them together. Yes, and when you speak, can you state your name, please? Hi, my name is Joan. Um, I think one of the things that, that is, is very important in the discourse is the language, and I think one of the first things is challenging notions of border protection in particular. That's where it all started. Where's the war? Who are we at war with? Sorry, that was a comment. My question is uh, an idea that was put forward at one of the sessions at the Festival of Ideas just this weekend about uh, having a crowd-funded, uh, you know, using social media, a crowd-funded journalist in locations like Manus Island um, to actually tell the stories that, uh, independently of the complicit media, um, to defy, if you like, what's going on in trying to absolutely shut down and silence the stories that you're talking about of individuals getting out there to the public and thus you know, preventing the public from engaging with what's happening to uh, asylum seekers. And I just wondered what your thoughts are about that, that suggestion. It seemed to me like a very, a very good one. It was Peter Frey from the, uh, the Herald that suggested it. First, I agree with the comment. And second, I think it's a good idea. If they can get into the camps, if they can tell the stories. Getting into the camps, not so easy. Um, I, I've been to the detention centre at Nauru and you have to give ID and get a card. And, and <laughs> curiously, um, I suppose this is inconsistent with sovereign borders, but it's Australians who run the detention centre in Nauru, even though theoretically it's all being done by Nauru, but it's Australian Department of Immigration officials who check whether or not you're allowed in. Now, um, I'm pretty confident they wouldn't allow journalists in. So what we need to do is arrange some undercover journalists who will go in. <laughs> you know, and you know, and one, of, one of the best developments uh, was when um, uh, a Melbourne-based reporter decided to conceal the fact that he was a reporter and got into Maribyrnong and it profoundly shifted what he was doing in relation to asylum seekers and he's later done a lot of terrific work. Uh, I, I think journalists actually have a responsibility to get inside by hook or by crook. And actually one or two have, and I'd just like to uh, say something in defence of some of the journalists because you've got people like Michael Gordon from The Age in Melbourne who's been tireless, really, in writing these stories. Um, and there have been many others. You've got that very brave young Jesse Taylor yeah. uh, who undercover went to Indonesia and produced the film. She's a between, by between the, the devil yes. and the deep blue sea. Yes. Jesse's right. on yes. the um, Anglican refugee network. Yes. There have been some very courageous, and there was recently a journalist who tried to get into Papua New Guinea and uh, into the uh, Manus Island detention centre, and uh, he got ping pong played like a ping pong ball back and forward between Australia and uh, New Guinea authorities, saying. Australian said, well, it's, we can't give you authority, it's up to the government of New Guinea, and New Guinea government said, no, Australia runs the centre, they have to give you permission. He went back and forward like this for a very long time. 
Um, so there have been some very courageous journalists out there telling, trying to tell these stories and trying to uncover what's going on. It is very important. Um, there has to be um, transparency in these policies. And this is another thing. You as citizen ought to protest very loudly about this. After all, you know, these are very conservative principles. And uh, it's what our democracy is based on, for goodness sake. I'm going Can to I move us to the next Can question. I jump in before Tim? I reckon what we should do is crowdsource some funding to send a couple of journalists to Indonesia and let them get on boats and let them come out and not have any papers and write the whole story. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just encourage you to go to the one on the other side, perhaps. No. Just move to the one on the other side. Uh, thank you. My name is Ian Law, and uh, I'm a boat person. I arrived here 50 years ago, and uh, I'm probably an illegal immigrant in that I neither sought nor was granted permission to uh, land in this country by the Ghana people. But look, having said that, um, I just wanted to uh, refer to a couple of quotes by politicians, they're fairly short. One of them is uh, that from my faith I derive the values of loving kindness, justice and righteousness. That was Scott Morrison in his first address to the House of Representatives in 2008. The other one, another great challenge of our age is asylum seekers. The biblical injunction to uh, care for the stranger in our midst is clear. That was from an, a, um, an article in Faith and Politics by Kevin Rudd in 2006. My question is, I, I'm angry by this, but I struggle to see how human beings can reconcile making such statements and then acting in ways that are totally hypocritical at best and mendacity at worst. Tim Costello. Well, I think that's for me. <laughs> so, uh, like you, I am uh, very distressed by that. The only thing I can say is um, the challenge is to let the best of faith defeat the worst of religion. It's equally true that a huge number of the people who have been outspoken are people of faith. Bruce Baird was one. It's equally true that uh, a whole heap of Salvation Army people are putting huge pressure now on the Salvation Army about their gagging and silence. Michael Gordon quoted me criticising them in an article just two weeks ago and I got a letter from the CEO of the Salvation Army from Sydney saying they've lifted the gag. Now if that's true, we already have some people who can tell some stories. They've been there. Uh, we need to keep saying to institutional religion, um, that's not the best of faith. That's actually not what... Now, a, a really good opportunity for this, have you look at, looked at the uh, Catholic makeup on uh, the uh, front bench of the coalition and of the uh, opposition? And you've now got a Pope who's saying some things that a few uh, of the signed up Catholics who are politicians must be squirming and feeling very uncomfortable about. Again, it's just my point. The best of faith, we have to hope, can defeat the worst of religion. And can I say, one? speaking as an atheist, I agree completely. <laughs> and I, I frankly don't think it's a very hard ethical position to get to. It's not hard to understand. You don't need to go to church to get it. I think I'll take one more question from that oh. side. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm somewhere in between, so maybe I've made them come back on. <laughs> Hi, my name is Margaret, and look at me. I'm an immigrant, and I'm here. Um, two little statements. Both people make out less than 2% of illegal people coming into Australia. That's the numbers. The other thing is mandatory detention is economically unsustainable. How does our government justify sending people offshore to PNG and to Nauru 
with minimal medical facilities for their own, never mind the thousands we're sending there. Both staff and client, uh, detainees, as he wants us to call them, live in appalling conditions. We have a duty of care. Let our complaint be that of the local cricket club in Weeper, who have been beaten by the, by the Weeper detainees for years in a row, have held that trophy, and they, they practice every single day. Those locals have no chance. They practice more than the Australian cricket team. <laughs> we have a duty of care. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say I agree with the sentiment? Um, I gather you come from South Africa. Yes, um, Nelson Mandela was a leader. We do not have a leader in Australia. That's our problem. And I'm going to uh, bring us to a conclusion. Um, but I leave you with a question, and maybe it could be answered in a brief sentence or many sentences, but what can local communities do to make a difference? Are there practical steps that community groups like churches, service clubs, even the sporting club can actually do next week, next month. One thing. One sentence from each of you. Okay. Let your Member of Parliament know if you do not support the policy. Speak loud and clear and often. It's your country. These policies are being implemented in your name in the Federal Parliament and I believe, my personal view is, that it will be to our lasting shame if we don't speak out. So please, make your voices heard. Make your voices heard and understand the power of one and befriend an asylum seeker. If you haven't got to know one, get to know one. I can highly recommend it. It's life-changing. Julian Burnside, one sentence. OK, encourage your local town council to hold simple community dinners in which equal numbers of recently arrived refugees and long-term residents will come together and share a really simple meal and have them placed one, the other, one, the other, one, the other, all round. Um, keep it really simple. It is very difficult to ignore another person's humanity when you've sat and had a meal with them. Thank you. Tim Costello. Yeah, I, I echo that. I, I would actually say elect to Parliament people like Judy. <laughs> and, uh, I think we actually do need some conscience and voices there in, in the major parties. Thank you. <laughs> Dr Limano. Well, we've had a fascinating discussion tonight. We've had at the outset a, an analysis by our panellists and by uh, our moderator of reinterpreting, finding the subtext of the political narrative that has been in this country. A political narrative that has frankly been very disingenuous as it seeks to paint other impressions about what is going on. Instead, as we've heard tonight, that political narrative with the subtitling of it, the subtexting of it, is such things as to reduce the humanity of one group in order to mistreat them. And a situation where we have out of sight, out of mind, has now been elevated to policy. And so the importance of this has been to help dispel the, the disingenuity of the narrative that is out there. But that is really only half the journey. Because each of our panellists and the, the moderator tonight challenged us with an alternative approach. To paraphrase an old cliché, the empire has no clothes. And we have to make that point well known in the wider community. And the operative phrase is we. And each one of our panellists made that point tonight. Geoffrey, you made the point before. What sort of humanity are we bequeathing? That is the question. And then we had the responses uh, put to us. Uh, we had, uh, we become part of the problem unless we actually seek to do something about that. We need the recovery of conscience. The art of the, uh, uh, the question, we know we are healthy, we know we are wealthy, but are we wise? And then, Judy, I thought you put this very powerfully. Each of us has the power to be part of the miracle of change. And so we may talk about the time it's taking, 
the fact that each one of us as individuals may doubt the capacity that we have to make a significant change. We may lament the fact that there has been a 12-year journey uh, in part of this. And yet, at the other side, the art of the moral universe bends slowly, but it bends towards justice, as we were told. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that, I think, is the challenge to us. We can agree on the picture of the empire having no clothes, but unless we are prepared to do something about that, then we are bequeathing an inhumanity. Are we prepared to be part of that? Would you please join me in thanking uh, our speakers tonight, uh, the Honourable Judy Moylan, the Reverend Tim Costello, Julian Burnside, and our moderator, the Reverend uh, Dr. Geoffrey Driver. And I want to thank each and every one of you for coming for being part of this. You now have the capacity to be a virus, that you can go out and virally spread that message through the community. I also encourage you to keep an eye out on the activities of the Don Dunson Foundation because this foundation has as its charter the means of taking on human decency, as a means of taking on policy issues and encouraging the public discourse on those matters. I also encourage you to look at uh, other organisations in, in terms of this refugee issue that do play a significant part. And Welcome to Australia has already been mentioned. Uh, that was founded here in South Australia and now is a national organisation uh, headed up by Brad Shilcott. Uh, and that is really about saying, put aside some of the political issues here. We want to say welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>